So I'm delighted that you're here today. As you finish eating, you can continue to eat. We are going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to start by introducing our three head tables today. So we have Margaret Holland's table, and Margaret's one of our sisters today. And her husband, Robert, sitting at her table, her daughter, Abby, her mother, Rose Lane, and her father, Ian, and Norma McClintock, and her daughter, Caroline, are there, and then Grandison and Camilla Burnside, all friends and cheering for Margaret today. <laughs> so I'll we'll go over here to Team Roar, I guess. Karen Roar's table's over here today, and she's one of our sisters. And sitting at her table are um, Errol, her husband, her daughter, Lisa, her son, Eric, her daughter-in-law, Lynn, and her three granddaughters, Sarah Garland, Maggie, and Catherine. And she also has Susan at her table, a special family friend. Um, and then at the center table, we're sort of the hanger-ons, I guess, but we're cheering for both teams. We, um, we have Amy Star Redwine and her husband, Derek. So Derek may have to wave because a couple people have tried to come over, and he doesn't have a name tag, so someone needs to get the man a name tag. Um, my husband, Sarah Steve Blair Tuning, is sitting at the head table, and she is our program chair for PW. She's the mastermind behind the logistics today for Sister Stories, which is a little bit different from all our other programs. Um, she's also confirmation mentor to Abby and Avery and Camilla and Zoe, and she had the great idea that it would be fun to invite them. They are all in confirmation class, and um, so sitting at the head table, at this head table are Zoe and Avery Ingram and Meredith Ingram, Avery's mother, <laughs> because she suggested the mothers and daughters come do this together, which was a neat idea. So, um, my last thing that I have to do right now is say, does anyone have a guest that they brought today that you would like to announce? Or introduce is the word I need to use. Any guests we want to introduce? Yes. Errol. Uh, Steve and Jane Sewell are our guests, and they're sitting over here. They're members of River Road Presbyterian Church. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad you're here. We hope you stay. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Well, can I? Yes. I have a friend, Linda Tiffany, who is here somewhere. Linda. Linda. She's right behind me. She's right here. Welcome. She's busy. Wonderful, welcome, so glad you're here. And if there are any other guests, we welcome you. Um, this is this is a fun one. Y'all are always welcome at the Presbyterian Women Luncheons. I don't know if you know that, gentlemen, but you are. So if you're ever interested, sign up. Um, this is just one that we seem to get more men into the room for. Um, so I'm gonna call Blair up and we're gonna get started. I would echo Melissa's um, welcome to you. This is the 13th of PW's special programs known as Sister Stories. It began as an annual program with three speakers and a chairman of the day. In 2011, in the interest of time and people's busy schedules, a decision was made to have two speakers and have each of those speakers select someone to introduce them. Then four years later, um, I won't say in the interest of time, but in the interest of um, encouraging people to be a sister and to share their story, the decision was made to do this every other year. So that's where we are today. 33 women including our two um, presenters today, have chosen to open their hearts and share their faith stories. If you are one of those sister storytellers, would you raise your hand? <laughs> Margaret and Karen, I hope you had a chance to look around and realize that in addition to your family, um, your friends, um, and all of the guests here today, you have those of us who have walked in your shoes um, here for you to support you, and we are really looking forward to hearing your stories. As Melissa mentioned, um, I am a confirmation mentor um, this year. I'm very proud of 
my, my four girls. And I did think it would be a wonderful opportunity for them to learn and sort of witness the history of Presbyterian women, the dedication and the love of this organization. So um, we are here to um, <coughs> support both teams, but we have a little more of a, a vested interest from my standpoint as a confirmation um, mentor because I am going to introduce our first introducer, Abby Crow. Aww. church almost every Sunday since I've been alive. <laughs> um, she's taught me so much about what it means to love everyone and to love God. My mom's work at Voices for Virginia's Children, where she's the executive director, has been very inspirational and has taught me what it means to be a hard-working mom and professional. I'm so proud of her and what she's done for this church. Here's my mom. <laughs> together. Um, so as an almost lifelong member of First Presbyterian, I really cannot talk about my faith without talking about this church and what it has meant to me. My parents were transferred to Richmond from Baton Rouge in 1974 when I was one and a half and my brother was four and the Nimos have been at FPC ever since. Now many of the experiences I have had at this church I have shared with many of you. So I'm going to have a little audience participation. So raise your hand if you ever went to First Presbyterian Preschool, or taught at First Presbyterian Preschool, or sent your kids or grandkids to First Presbyterian Preschool. Okay, well, as it turns out, I am a proud graduate of the class of 1974, six, six, 1976. All right, working on my math. Um, so I, I've been here quite a long time. The preschool is a great part of our church. There are also some other folks here who've been in first Presbyterian preschool. So it's been important to our family and our group of, of confirmands as well. I recognize uh, a few folks in there, little Avery Ingram, little Abby Crow, Mary Garrison. Um, all right, here's another one. Raise your hand if you've ever participated in the music ministry. Okay, good show of hands. Apparently, I did too. Oh. <laughs> 1978-79. I think that might have been mostly for attendance, but, <laughs> but there are also some other folks in our family who participated. I believe this would be Wham. Oh. We had Zoe. We have Abby. We have Malone, another confirmand. We have Taylor Aronson, another confirmand. Um, this would be singing, uh, I believe it's Wham, singing at what we call Banjo Church in our family. Um, that would be what Abby named the open door service long ago. <laughs> so truly, um, the most important part of First Presbyterian is the people. When I was growing at a, up at FBC, there were two couples who were especially important to our family, the Foys and the Kurds. 
They were like our in-town grandparents since ours lived so far away. Martha and Eddie Foy were our next door neighbors when we moved to Richmond. They are the reason that we came to FPC. It was their invitation. They always took an interest in what Andy and I were doing, and I remember they even came to my high school graduation. The Kurds also took us on, inviting us over for lunch after church on many occasions and being an in-town support for my parents. I've heard mom say that we thought we were the only family they adopted at church, but in fact, I believe they were loving and gracious to many families in the church. Both the Foy's and the Kurds had a way of making us feel like we were special and that we belonged at FPC. Of course, the faith of my parents and their commitment to this church has been a model for me, as has the faith of my grandparents on both sides. Thank you. It's really, really hard to see. I did not forget my glasses. Whether they were Baptist or Presbyterian, they showed me that their participation in church was an important part of their lives. I could see that it nurtured them personally, but it also provided a way they gave back to the community. There are also many people of several generations in this church who have nurtured me, working in the nursery. Several years ago, Peggy Wright told me the story that she remembers she was holding me at a church picnic after we first moved here. There are people in here who've taught me Sunday school, who've led youth group. There are people here in this room I know who have prayed for me in the difficult times of my life, and I know that they still do. This church has also nurtured Abby, as we've seen, preschool, music ministry, Sunday school, vacation Bible school, and now youth group. One of the ways that the church and my faith have influenced me is in the choice of work that I do. <coughs> I that's it. I'm the executive director, as Abby said, of Voices for Virginia's Children. We're a statewide nonprofit child advocacy organization. Our mission is to champion public policies that improve the lives of Virginia's children. When laws and other policy decisions are being made, we literally serve as the voice for kids, especially those who have been left out or whose needs have been overlooked. You might not realize it, but decisions are made every day that impact the lives of children throughout Virginia, and children are not at the table to tell policymakers what they need, so we are. Our organization is nonpartisan, and I've worked very hard over the years to build relationships with policymakers on both sides of the aisle. We are in it for the long haul as advocates. Elected officials will come and go. The fortunes of one party will rise, only to fall in the next election cycle. But the needs of children will continue. And while the role of families and faith communities and the private sector are all very important, the sweeping impact of laws and public funding cannot be overlooked. And so I have worked for 15 or so years to try to make laws and funding a little fairer for kids, especially those who tend to get left out. <coughs> Our beloved former associate pastor, Rosalind Banbury, put it to me another way one day. She referred to my work as ministry. I never really considered myself in ministry. But if you think about it, all of us as Christians are taking our faith out into the world every day. And what we do with it becomes our ministry. So while the organization I work for is not faith-based, my faith guides my work personally. And not surprisingly, I find inspiration in Micah 6.8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? But what does all this mean in my day-to-day -day work? Working for social justice or including those who've been left out or speaking up for those whose voices are not being heard can sound pretty abstract. And Voices, we're a multi-issue organization dealing with everything from early childhood education to foster care to health insurance. But I have spent much of my time advocating for better access to mental health care for children. So here's what that can look like in real life. In the early 2000s, when I was pretty new to this work, I was traveling around the state and listening to the stories of families, of grandparents and parents whose children had mental health issues. I was learning about the various barriers to getting the care that the kids needed, whether it was counseling or medication or something more intensive. Some of the things I learned had to do with insurance. Whether they had public or private insurance, it likely did not cover what they needed. Often, particularly in rural areas, but even right here in Richmond, the services a child needed weren't available, or the wait list was so long that they would be on a wait list for six months and end up in the hospital before they ever got what they needed. And of course, there's the issue of stigma. Families feel embarrassed sometimes when their child has a mental health problem, and that keeps them from seeking the support that they need. And that's not unfounded, because we do have a history of blaming parents for their children's mental health problems. So these are all issues that have a public policy component, and they're issues that we've worked on at Voices. 
But one of the most disturbing challenges faced by parents that I talked to all over the state was if their children had a really serious mental health challenge, they were being forced to give up custody of their kids to social services. I met families who had reached a point after many years of struggle to find the right help for a child in psychiatric crisis. They maxed out on health insurance benefits, they blown through their family savings, and usually they were trying to get their children into a really intensive and really expensive residential treatment program. And they were told that the only way to get help paying for this very expensive treatment that their child desperately needed was to give up custody to social services, which is the system that cares for children who've been abused and neglected. That was the only way to get assistance paying for this treatment. So Trudy was one of the very brave parents I got to know at this point who was willing to share her story publicly. And that made all the difference. There's something called the State Executive Council within state government. They control a pot of funds that help children who have serious mental health conditions or in foster care or in special education. And so they meet periodically. So Trudy and I went to that meeting and we gave public comment. We told the Secretary of Health and Human Resources, who chaired the group, and the heads of several state agencies, as well as the legislators who were there, the story of what was happening to these families. I had the data and research, and she had her family's story to make that data real. <clears throat> the Secretary of Health and Human Resources, on the spot, decided to form a work group to study it. I was asked to pull together a group of parents from all over the state who had faced this dilemma so that they could share their stories. Some had given up custody, and some had held out and tried to patch together services. Usually their kids just lurched from one crisis to the next, sometimes ending up in the hospital. It was a really emotional meeting, as you can imagine. But in combination with getting some media coverage on this issue, it worked. It took several years and several steps, but legislation was passed, and Attorney General's opinion was rendered in our favor, and funding was allocated so that parents in Virginia no longer face that particular barrier anymore. So what does my faith have to do with this? Well, I came to the realization through that experience that I had been given the gift of being able to advocate, of being able to break down complex situations into more manageable pieces, of being able to suggest a course of action that somehow made sense to the people who had the ability to affect change. I did not earn this gift. I actually hadn't even been in my job that long, which might have been to my advantage, because I'm not sure it really occurred to me not to speak out about what was going on. But when I did, I realized that my actions had an impact on people in power. And that was pretty amazing and pretty humbling. A current example of trying to live out my faith in my work is the privilege I've had of working with a mom who lost her daughter in the Virginia Tech shooting. Quite a few of the parents affected by this terrible tragedy have become advocates, most speaking up on gun issues. But this mom, Beth, decided to focus her energy on the mental health system, trying to ensure that no other teenagers with mental illness fell through the cracks between high school and college, the way the perpetrator of the Virginia Tech shooting did. If you want to talk about standing up for someone who is ex excluded, that's a pretty great example. My colleagues and I have had the privilege of walking beside Beth in this journey, listening to her goals, explaining how the legislative system works, whenever possible, opening up opportunities for her to advocate. We supported her appointment to the State Board of Behavioral <laughs> Health, and she makes legislative visits with us every year on Mental Health Advocacy Day. She testifies at public hearings, and she shares her story, and she works for good to come out of a truly tragic situation. We are privileged to help her translate her passion into action. Her advocacy, along with that of others, has helped us win millions of dollars of state funding for children's mental health crisis services over the last several years. This advocacy will never bring her daughter back but to me, it shows that God can work to redeem even the darkest situations. And as a Christian, I can do my small part to allow God's love to show through the gifts that I have been given. There's a contemporary Christian song by Jason Gray that has some wonderful lyrics that I find inspiring. And if my award had been for something other than attendance, I might sing it to you, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> we bring the kingdom come with every act of love. Jesus, help us carry you. Alive in us, your light shines through. With every act of love, we bring the kingdom come. God put a million, million doors in the world for his love to walk through, and one of those doors is you. I have been asked at various points, including very recently, how I can continue to do the work that I do, given who I have to work with. 
that is politicians. <laughs> no offense, if you're in an elected office, you're married to someone who is. <laughs> Since I really don't like partisan politics or get involved in it, that's a fair question. And I think it boils down to this. I care deeply about kids and their well-being. I believe that all kids matter and that each child matters. Every child has a purpose in life given to them by God. Who are we to take that away? Or sit back and let systems disadvantage some children because of a disability or because of where they live or the color of their skin, as if they're not valuable to God. I see that entering the government arena is necessary <coughs> so that all children can grow up with the opportunity to thrive. And I've also gotten to know elected and appointed officials who are very smart, caring, and compassionate people. People who have entered public service because they want to do what they consider to be the right thing for their constituents. And the really good ones listen because they realize that they are not an expert on everything. I'm reminded of Teddy Roosevelt's 1910 speech about the man in the arena. And even though it's not about Christians in particular, I think it's apt when you're trying to live out your faith in the world, which can be pretty messy. It is not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Being part of this faith community has nurtured me and continues to feed me to do this work. The love and support of fellow church members, preaching on social justice, examples from scripture, Amy's sermon a couple of weeks ago, in which she told us Jesus' message was for all people. All are included. And in my job, that means all children in Virginia. What I want for my child is pretty much what all parents want for their children. And as amazing as I think my child is, and she is, you could just ask her grandparents. <laughs> She's like the full list for accomplishments. Uh, she is not the only one who deserves to be healthy and happy. God makes each child in his image, and therefore each child deserves the chance to thrive. Having learned that my actions can have an impact for good, for whatever time I'm in this position, it is my responsibility to use the power I have to the best of my ability. As you can see, my, my job is fairly time-consuming and can be pretty intense, but that is by no means the most important part of my life. I was blessed almost three years ago to marry a wonderful man, Robert, and I am a devoted mother to Abby, and now stepmom to two grown, uh, Robert's two grown sons, Sam and Max. <laughs> so you might wonder why I said yes when asked to serve on the PNC almost three years ago. <laughs> and yes, it did start the exact same month that we got married. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that everyone in my household has asked why I said yes. <laughs> and this is why. My church has been an important part of my life for almost all of my life because of the people in it and the way it has nurtured my faith. I want my family and every family and individual who comes in the doors of FPC to feel that same love. And in our faith tradition, the way we choose the pastor, for better or for worse, is the PNC, and that requires participation. If called, it requires entering the arena. It means praying and being lifted up in prayer. It means listening to lots and lots and lots of sermons. <laughs> it means learning more about our denomination. It means getting to know an amazing group of church members and Christians, my fellow members of the PNC. And it means persevering, regardless of criticism or impatience or anxiety, until we find the person we believe God is calling to our church. And that is what we do. And I am grateful that I had the opportunity to live out my faith as part of that experience. And I could not be more grateful or thrilled that Amy is here with us now. And you. And the kids. <laughs> I'm also happy to say that the PNC is now over, but Robert is still here. <laughs> That's one of our best accomplishments. I will close with some verses that Mrs. Kurd wrote down for me on a little piece of paper, which I still keep in my Bible. She called it my creed, and I have subsequently learned that it is the first verse of a hymn by Howard Walter, written in 1906. 
I would be true, for there are those who trust me. I would be pure, for there are those who care. I would be strong, for there is much to suffer. I would be brave, for there is much to dare. I would be a friend to all, the friend, the foe, the friendless. I would be giving and forget the gift. I would be humble, for I know my weakness. I would look up and laugh and love and lift. Thank you. I'm going to start with uh, a brief slideshow of um, some of Karen's heritage. Uh, it's, it's common in our home when we give thanks at a meal to pray a prayer that my father prayed, I think, almost every day of his adult life, and that was to thank God for his godly heritage. And Karen has a godly heritage, and I want to play just a brief slideshow of some of her um, family. Karen's mother, Aletha Gegner. Whoa. <laughs> She's beautiful, but I'm, I'm not sure why. <laughs> daughter to the rescue. <laughs> this is Karen's father, Robert Gagner, and her mother. Karen, when she was a little girl, beautiful. Her mother, her two brothers, and Karen, and the home she grew up in, Xenia, Ohio, when I first met her. Karen is homecoming queen at her high school in Xenia, Ohio our engagement party at Wheaton College in Illinois. My bride. Our first daughter and only one, Lisa. Our son, Eric. And this is Karen. I think you could recognize her. She's the one in the middle. Her two brothers and her two sisters-in-law, Karen loves to dress up in costume. <laughs> Go Ohio State. <laughs> I.O. Our daughter Lisa, our son Eric, and our beautiful, wonderful daughter-in-law Lynn. And did I mention we have three beautiful granddaughters? <laughs> 
And just stay on that one, Sarah Gurman, and that's good. You can. This, um, this last slide <clears throat> is an entry from Karen's journal when she was nine years old. And it reads as follows. Saturday, September 29th. There aren't any members in this club but me, Karen Gagner. My name in this club, Dense Duco Poala Girl. Club's name is Karen Gagner. This is a secret club. <laughs> Loudmouth Denny Bone told everyone I had a club. I, I tried to start one with him. It was my mistake. <laughs> I probably knew he would pop off. The meeting was dismissed by Kay Gagner. Signed by Secretary Kay Gagner. God is the head of Duco Puella. By the way, Duco Puella means the girl who leads. You can turn on the lights now. Those minutes from the K. Gagner Club's first and only meeting <laughs> are framed and they hang on our wall in our home. They remind me of what a sassy, savvy, sensational, and supremely talented woman my wife is. Like her mother, Karen is kind, compassionate, full of faith, a gourmet cook, a wonderful, caring mother, and the best friend anyone could possibly have. I know, she's my best friend. And there's no one in the world I would rather spend time with than her, or have fun with, or share my life with, than Karen. It thrills me to no end to see how many good friends Karen has. She has friends from long ago, and she stays in touch with them all. She writes them letters. She calls them on the phone. She makes new friends all the time. Every time, this is, this is the truth, every time I leave the house, for whatever occasion, Karen always says to me, make a friend. When I come, from, come home from the golf course, I am always happy to say I tried. <laughs> she also tells me to shoot her age, and I usually say I did at some point during the round. <laughs> I've walked into Fresh Market when Karen, with Karen and stood in amazement as clerks rushed over to hug Karen and tell her how glad they were that she was there. No wonder she was homecoming queen at Xenia High School and the most popular girl in the school. Like her father, Karen is smart, super organized, can multitask, and has an entrepreneurial spirit. I have often said that if Karen had gone into business instead of teaching, we would be rich. She didn't, and we are not. <laughs> Karen also has spunk and an I'll show you attitude. Get this. She asked her eighth grade teacher if anyone had ever gotten a perfect score on the Ohio State math exam. Her teacher responded that no one ever had, and quote, don't you think you can do it? That's the wrong thing to say to Duco Puella. <laughs> she studied extra hard, and when the state scores were posted on the school board, bulletin board, Karen Gagner's name was at the top with a perfect score. Can you imagine? I didn't even know how to add in the eighth grade. Her teacher told her, I knew you could do it. <laughs> when Karen was 10, almost 69 years ago, she wrote a few lines in one of her poems that reveals her healthy self-esteem and honesty. She writes, and I quote, God made you and God made me. He made us as perfect as we could be. 
And we should love him as he loves us, and we shouldn't lie or make a fuss. <laughs> End of quote. I could go on and on about this talented, wonderful, amazing woman who I love with all my heart and soul, but the last slide... <coughs> The last slide uh, shows that Karen has a story that was drawn by her very talented artistic brother, Phil. Uh, she used to give the children's stories at uh, children's lessons in church uh, when we were in Tennessee. Um, so I'll let her tell her own story. Please welcome Karen. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> I am a sinner saved by grace. My confession that I am a sinner is supported by empirical or anecdotal evidence. <laughs> for <clears throat> two different episodes in my li young life. When I was five years old, in 1945, my daddy, who was a meat cutter and in business with his father and older brother in Zinni, Ohio, decided to take a job in Bell Fountain, Ohio. I was not told the reason for the move, but I think it was due to discord in the family-owned meat shop. We rented a house there, and I immediately explored the neighborhood for friends. I soon learned that a girl named Marcia was a bully and terrorized the other children. I decided to put a stop to that. <laughs> my mother had planned my sixth birthday party and invited all the neighborhood children. Mother, Marcia, should not be included. She will take over and ruin my party. Oh, Karen, be nice. Of course Marcia will be included. Big mistake, mother. <laughs> Marcia started the room, ruin as soon as she arrived. I went to the kitchen and found one of my daddy's really big Butcher knives. <laughs> Put it. <laughs> Put it close to her face and told her to go home. <laughs> she took off running, and I, in close pursuit, swinging the knife. Marcia went home whimpering. The knife's wooden handle, handle measured five inches. The steel blade ten, slightly curved 10 inches. When Errol and I set up housekeeping, Daddy gave us that knife. <laughs> and the sharpener that goes with it sharp. We moved back to Xenia nine months later. Second episode. Becoming a thief soon after the knife incident. I like money and always have. Growing up in the 1940s and 50s, various men came to our house to deliver milk, bread, and dry cleaning. A boy delivered the newspaper. My mother paid them in cash and left the change on the top shelf of the bookcase in the foyer. I began stealing some of the change a, on a regular basis. Once I took a crisp 
dollar bill, but decided that was too risky, so I stuck with the change. <laughs> I knew stealing was wrong because I knew I couldn't spend it without being caught. I really liked money. I liked to organize it and count it and manipulate various combinations of the coins to equal one dollar. For Christmas, I asked Santa for a red metal toy cash register, and it came through with the best one Sears Robot catalog feature. Oh, how I wish I still had it. Not a plastic version, but the metal kind with a bell that rang when you hit the button to open the door. I continued stealing for two years. <laughs> In the late spring of 1948, a very respected lady in our town invited my brother Larry, age 15, and my brother Phil, 13, to, a, to an evangelistic meeting sponsored by the Christian Businessmen Business Association. My mother decided to go with them. After that meeting, I noticed a distinct difference in all three of them, especially Phil. Phil was a budding artist, but had a temper and had easily gotten into fit fights, fist fights and other trouble. Something about him had changed. I wondered what happened at that meeting. In June, we went on a family vacation to the Quick Era Resort on Big Manistee Lake in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. It was a splendid place. One of the children living on a farm near the resort invited me to go to daily vacation Bible school at the Lakefield Baptist Church, and I was glad to go. I love Bible school from the get-go. Friendly people, art projects, games, snacks, and then the flannel graph Bible story, which was new to me. The story was about Paul and Silas in prison in Philippi, Acts 16. A jailer was ordered to guard them carefully and put their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a, such a violent earthquake, the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house, King James Version. Acts 16.31. I was puzzled by the words, thy house. So, and asked the storyteller what it meant. She explained house or household meant your family. It occurred to me that my mother and brothers must have been saved at that meeting. All the children were given Acts 16.31 printed on a little colored piece of construction paper to memorize. 
You could earn points to win a prize by memorizing the Bible verse, perfect attendance, <coughs> att uh, bringing your Bible to DVB, and inviting a friend to DVB. I really like the idea of earning points, <laughs> as many points as possible. <laughs> Back at the resort, I played the rest of the day on the lake, in the lake, in the woods, and on the resort grounds. <coughs> By bedtime, I was exhausted and, and about to fall asleep when I remembered I hadn't memorized my Bible verse. As I studied the words, I was convicted of my sins, especially the stealing. I didn't grasp the idea of conviction of sin until later, but God's word that night, God's word made me feel awful, and I started crying. It dawned on me that Phil could help me. The boys were asleep, but I shook Phil awake, and with my Bible verse clenched in my hand, I sobbed. Is this what happened to you? Have you gotten saved? He groggily away, aroused and we went out into the living room where he could see what I had in my hand. Yes, I've been saved. Well, I retorted, tell me what to do. My 13-year-old brother taught his 8-year-old sister how to pray the sinner's prayer and ask Jesus to be her savior. Like Eustace Clarence Scrub, after his undragging, he was a different boy. To be strictly accurate, he began to be a different boy. He had relapses. I began to be a different girl, but I continued to have relapses. At age 12, my daddy took out a life insurance policy for each of us, which, was requir which required a full physical <coughs> examination. I had my exam several months before my 13th birthday in March. The doctor listened to my heart and appeared to be alarmed, talked to my mother, and arrangements were made immediately for me to have experimental heart surgery at the Children's Hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio. My condition was called patent ductus arteriosus, a valve in the heart that is supposed to close at birth didn't in my case. The left side of my heart was enlarged. My parents were told that I might may not survive. People gathered at our church to pray around the clock. The surgery took nine hours. When they were finished, the head surgeon, Dr. Helmsworth, asked my parents if people were praying for me. He said, it seemed as if a higher power was guiding my hands. Needless to say, the surgery was, successfully, was successful, and I firm, fervently believe that God answers prayer. This condition is now easily taken care of at birth. In my mother, I observed firsthand the qualities of compassion, goodness, humility, hospitality, hard work, and the love of reading and cooking and baking. From the time I was very young, I would help her with her household chores. She would explain what she was doing and how to do it. I could tell she really liked keeping house. 
My mother's compassion was demonstrated as she cared for the poor, the imprisoned, the runaway, international university students, missionaries, and guest speakers. Everyone knew you were always welcome in our home, and the food you ate at Elisa Gagner's table was always from scratch and the best you would ever taste. <clears throat> One illustration, to, one story to illustrate. In second grade, I sat across the aisle from Ernie Estel. One cold morning before class started, I noticed his hand was bandaged with gauze, with blood showing through. Ernie Estel, what happened? I asked. I chopped off the end of my, uh, with, uh, my finger with the axe, he replied. Why in the world were you playing with an axe? I wasn't playing, it's work. I do at home. I chop all the wood for the stove to cook and keep warm. Ernie Estel, are you poor? He looked at me and carefully said, yeah, I think I'm poor. That evening after dinner, that evening at dinner after daddy said the blessing, I hit the table with my open palm and firmly announced, Ernie Estel is poor and we have to do something about it and do something about it, my mother did. She visited Ernie's mother and got to know the family over time. Ernie's dad, an alcoholic, was unemployed. My mother found help for his drinking and secured a job on his behalf. She made sure they all had enough food and clothes we were friends with Ernie Estel and his family for several years until they moved away. Although my dad was brusque, his German ancestry, he always handled me with care and affection. Every spring of my childhood, I hunted morel mushrooms with him in the woods on my maternal grandma, grandparents' home, farm, I'm sorry. I wanted so much to find a big mess on my own and would pray to Jesus to help me. How thrilling when it happened. Even as a child, my daddy gave me responsibilities, making his bank deposits, helping out in the meat department, shopping for gifts for my mother. Once my daddy told me, honey, you can do anything you set your mind to. That has been my mantra ever since. When I graduated from the Ohio State University with my doctoral degree, he said to me, I really don't understand what a PhD is but I'm sure proud you got it. <laughs> In the 1950s, my daddy taught me that prejudice and discrimination were not to be tolerated in the Gagner family. His uncle owned and was the sole operator of a barber shop in Yellow Springs, Ohio, 15 miles from Xenia. One Saturday morning, on the front page of the Xenia Gazette was a full-page photograph of his uncle, John Gagner, barring the door to his barber shop, refusing to cut the hair of an African-American. Antioch colleges, college students were protesting on the street. Daddy thoughtfully explained the meaning of the words prejudice and discrimination to me. 
shaken, he spoke of the shame that his uncle was bringing to the Gegner name by his attitudes and actions. As a child, I made rules for myself. Long before I became interested in boys, I made this rule. Never say I love you to a boy unless you really, really mean it. <laughs> At age 14, I started dating. The time would come in the relationship when the boy would say to me, Karen, I love you. Silence. <laughs> <laughs> he repeated his declaration. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> Finally, I stated my rule and assured him that I thought he was a very nice boy <laughs> and I enjoyed spending time with him. But I couldn't say I love you to him because I didn't. And that's how it went until at age 16, I met Errol Ruler, age 19. He knocked my socks off. <laughs> I liked everything about him. We really enjoyed each other's company, but we were very young, and Errol needed to find his niche, so he joined the United States Air Force in the station and was stationed in Japan and Okinawa. During that time, I was an undergraduate at Wheaton College in Illinois with a double major in English and history. Errol and I were good friends and kept up a lively correspondence about what we were reading. Scripture, literature, history, philosophy, theology, psychology, sociology. We prayed for each other. I was involved with other students who taught Sunday school in the projects on the south side of Chicago. I had an active social life and loved being at Wheaton. Because I was a serious student who took both reading and lecture notes, many of my male classmates asked me out on study dates. <laughs> Most no notable was Wes Craven, who went on to become famous for his horror movies. <laughs> he is best known for creating A Nightmare on Elm Street <laughs> and Scream, featuring the characters of Freddy Krueger and Ghostface, respect respectively. During the summer, before my junior year, Errol was discharged from the Air Honor <laughs> from the Air Force. He came home and we fell in love. Errol, uh, joyfully, I told him over and over again, I love you. <laughs> in June of 1962, we were married. Errol was an undergraduate at Central State University, Wilberforce, Ohio, near Xenia, studying philosophy while I taught seventh grade English. <coughs> Unexpectedly, we learned we were expecting our first child and were thrilled. <coughs> because Errol was an older student, he was given permission to fulfill a health education requirement by doing an independent study on prenatal and postnatal care. <laughs> I was reading the book as well. One morning, six weeks before our due date, there was a clear indication that I needed to get to the hospital. I was checked and the nurse ho hollered, oh, expletive, <laughs> she's ready to deliver. They started some medication to prepare me for general anesthesia. 
When Dr. Horner came in, I bolted up, waving my arms wildly, explaining, wait a minute, I haven't read the chapter on labor and delivery. <laughs> Dr. Warner calmly said, Karen, lie down, I have. <laughs> we named our beautiful baby daughter, Lisa Ann. Two and a half years later, our son Eric, Gain our son Eric Gainer was born in Princeton, New Jersey. Errol was studying at Princeton Theological Seminary and also taking courses in philosophy at Princeton University. I informed the OBGYN doctor that I had a shorter gestation period because our daughter was born six weeks early and that I had no idea what labor felt like because I had not experienced it with my first delivery. He told me that I needed to get a project. I started knitting <laughs> three weeks before this baby was due during a routine checkup. The doctor asked me how long I had been in labor. <laughs> Nothing hurts. I, I couldn't be in labor. He told me to pay attention to contractions which may not hurt. Later that afternoon, after 28 minutes of painless contraction, we joyfully welcomed our son, Eric Gaynor, into the world. I know you women who have gone through 17 hours of labor hate to hear that. In 1984, we moved to Bristol, Tennessee and became professors at King College later King University. We took students to countries all over the world on mission projects. Papua New Guinea, Jamaica, Hong Kong, Singapore, Ecuador, India, Honduras, Brazil, and study, study abroad programs in Israel, Egypt, Turkey, and Greece. We spent seven May terms in Italy as a part of the Italy study program which Errol founded. I loved my teaching, teaching my students and challenging them to do their very best. Psychology courses I taught, three developmental courses, child, adolescent, and lifespan, marriage and the family, and general psychology. In 2014, Errol and I retired after 30 years at King and moved to Richmond, Virginia to be close to our family. Much of my story has become our story. I'm so thankful that the Lord, by his mercy and grace, brought us together and kept us together 57 years this June. Uh, our children, Lisa and Eric, our daughter-in-law, Lynn, our granddaughters, Sarah Garman, Maggie, and Catherine, have brought us so much joy, and we are deeply grateful. I am a sinner, and thankfully, I am saved by amazing grace. And now, uh, Stanley Fountain uh, is going to sing Amazing Grace accompanied by Suzanne Real. <laughs> Oh, 
Amen. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much, Margaret and Karen and Errol and Abby and everyone else involved. Um, it was another wonderful sister stories. And at this time, I want to share with you this week, as we were doing some of the behind the scenes work, one of our former sisters, Emily Tackle, reached out to me and suggested and gather, or that we gather all our past sister stories in some format to share, which I think has come up in the past. So we're going to embark on that project. Blair and I wholeheartedly agreed that we need to try to do this. So sisters, watch for um, an invitation to share hopefully a hard copy of your story that you have somewhere in your house, um, as well as a gathering. Um, and everyone else, stay tuned um, as we figure out how to compile these and share these stories with you all. Um, I have some thanks that I want to offer and some prayers as we go on with the rest of our days. I want to thank our Mary Marthas, Barbara Bingham, Sue Folks, Martha Morrill, Sally Phillips, and Beth Witt, who were here early and set up for us and took good care of us, so thank you. Um, I want to express gratitude for Terry White, who did the beautiful flowers. If you'd like to take some home or take some tulips to a friend, um, you may give Blair Tuning $5. The flowers on the head tables are not available for purchase. Um, they're for our sisters. Um, as you leave today, please pray for Barbara Caperton, Tom Holloway, Ken Horton, Hermie Powell, and Gary Wright. And we rejoice with Mary and Bill Garrison on the birth of their granddaughter, Evelyn Marie, and Evelyn's parents are Meredith and Stephen. Um, I have a lot of people we're grieving with. We grieve alongside the family of John Counts, who died on February 27th, with Doug Boudinot, whose father died on February 24th, with Kathy Smallwood, whose mother died on February 2nd, with the family of Ann Sneed, who died on February 6th, with the family of Margaret Ford, who died on February 8th, with Elizabeth Saunders, whose grandfather died on February 17th, and with Ann Dunnington, whose cousin died in February. And I also wanted to share with you, I learned this morning, Teresa Lowe, who's our caterer with Yummings Catering. Um, her mother died at the end of last week, and we thank her team for stepping in and providing our lunch today. So please keep her in your prayers. Um, we also remember our military heroes, Edward Allen, Jenny Sigal Burkett, Matthew Horton, Mason Loudon, Nathan Thomas Mead, and Connor Parlow. We hope to see you all on April 2nd. That's our next PW program. We will be collecting our PW birthday offering at that time, as well as voting on the bylaws. So if you haven't read them, please do. <laughs> um, thank you again, everyone, for being here today. And I'm going to ask that we do another round of applause. And I have someone waving at me. Um, yes, Dorothy. Sure. Dorothy's also a former sister, so I'm going to I'm going to trust that she's going to say something appropriate. <laughs> and amazing, probably, too. <laughs> um, I was just sitting there listening to these beautiful stories from these incredible women, and it took me back to when I gave my story, which took, as we know, uh, it just takes a lot of courage to get up here and do this. And personally, I want to thank you both women and all sisters who have shared their story, but I was moved to come up here before you today because I don't know if I'll have another chance to do this. <laughs> um, many of you know that Stephen and I are leaving the church. We are building a house and moving to North Carolina. It is almost finished. Uh, if it would stop raining, we can dig a sewer system and we can move on but um, and then our house is on the market here so if you know of anybody that wants a beautiful home on Willway <laughs> spread the word but it was imperative to me to stand before you with perhaps my last opportunity to tell you how much this church and you beautiful women and some of you sweet little men <laughs> have meant to me and to my husband. Um, you know, when you first start in a new experience, you look around and you think, well, what do I have in common with these people? You know, how am I going to get to know these people? But God is so good and has just blessed Stephen and I with beautiful friendships in this church, 
um, beautiful um, opportunities to serve the Lord. Uh, we've been on committees with uh, several of you. We've been in small groups with lots of you. And this church is indeed a family, and we will miss you all so very much. But I did not want to miss this opportunity to tell you how much we truly love you and this church and to thank you. We love you. Yeah. Again, and um, I know Blair has something for our ladies who spoke, and I wish you a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you so much for coming.